Turn to the Circuit de la Sarthe. Those beautiful French blue skies have given way to the lights of the carnival and race cars ripping through the beautiful French countryside. Welcome back to the 73rd running of the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans here in Le Mans, France. And of course, the lights of pit lane. And at this moment, unfortunately, the lights of safety cars. I'm Greg Kramer, joined by Dorsey Schrader and Alain Decadne here in the booth. Chris Neville and Andrew Marriott in pit lane. And we are under our third caution of the event by our calculations. It happened at the 104th lap. And we'll explain how that developed momentarily. Here's the current running order. The great news for America's champion uh, Audi team with Tom Christensen in the lead car. Great news for him and possibly that record. His teammate right now, Frank Biela, in second and in third, the Mugen Dome. And uh, they have been very, very quick indeed in the LMP2 category. A great development. American Liz Halliday. Yes, she currently lives in England, but she is American. And she is leading in the Intersport Lola in the LMP2 category with the Belmondo Courage Ford and the Courage Ford number 36 team car filling out that category we go to the GT divisions the GT1 Ron Fellows has just taken the lead in the GT1 division his teammate is sits in second the number 58 Aston Martin was leading and pitted during this yellow and has now dropped to third and then GT2 the 71 and 90 those two great American teams that have been running so well continue to run first and second with the number 76 Porsche in the hands of Roman Dumas sits in the third spot so that is where we sit in the top three in each of our divisions at this time now once again we talked about how the great news has been unfolding for ADT champion Audi with more on that let's get down to Andrew Marriott yes indeed and uh, JJ Leto looking very relaxed well for seven hours in JJ you couldn't have believed it would be this good for you well I'm a little bit surprised like we all at Audi um, it happened a little bit earlier than I thought Pescarolo is really fast car and they have been doing a good job but of course they make a couple of mistakes and they had a puncture and gearbox problems and uh, hitting something else so uh, that's the thing we said already before the race that you need to stay out of trouble and uh, just do constant running try to stay out of the pits as much as possible only fuel tires change the driver off you go again we can see it all the time that the uh, our car is definitely not the fastest one we are losing a lot on straight lines but you know that's the way it is and we just have to make the maximum out of the car but before that yellow they were only taking one two seconds out of you a lap yeah, it just depends always. I think that in the beginning of the race they pushed really hard and uh, of course now it starts to be the time that you need to have the reliability as well. Drop a little bit of speed, drop a little bit of revs, save a little bit more fuel, do more laps. Audi is good because you don't really need to do that much. It's, it's, uh, it's almost qualifying form still with the car, so it's, uh, that's good for us. We're thanks, getting closer. Thanks very much, JJ. There are all sorts of stars over here. I just spotted Nick Mason here. Nick, you're making the headlines uh, at the moment, aren't you? You're going to reform Pink Floyd, especially for this new concert. Gosh, how did you find that out? It's all over the papers. <laughs> oh, right, yes. But meanwhile, of course, you've raced here in the past in Alola, and then uh, you were in the vintage race yesterday. Enjoyed that? Well, this morning, indeed. Yes, it was this morning. Doesn't time fly? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful place, Lamar. I mean, it's just... I've been here as uh, for historics, for the real thing, and as an entrance. And every version of it is terrific. And just going back to the music again, you must be looking forward to, to playing with Dave Gilmore and all the boys again. Um, yes, I think it's... Um, I mean, it's, what's really nice is it's a great reason to actually get back together. And um, I, I think that counts for something. Huh? Just a one-off? I think so. Thanks very much, Nick. And just moving over here, we've got a former winner of the race, Richard Atwood, one of those marvellous Porsche 917s. How are you, Richard, it's great to see you. Still enjoy it, looking so young. Um, well, thank you for that. I'm sure it's not true. But, uh, yeah, no, I haven't been here since 1984, so it's a long time ago. 
and it hasn't changed that much. Uh, the whole place has changed totally. Yeah, I mean, uh, all the buildings are different, this, uh, the pit area and, uh, you know, everything's been rebuilt, but, um, yeah. So, These pits are better than the old ones, aren't they? Well, uh, I think a lot of people prefer the old ones. <laughs> no, it's nostalgia, really. Um, it, it's, uh, I've been invited over by Audi very kindly, and, um, you know, that's why I'm here, really. I wouldn't be here for them, uh, other than for them. Um, and I'm just, yeah, it, the whole thing has changed so much. I mean, now, in my day, it was very much looking after the car, managing the whole thing, but now it's just a flat-out sprint, and that's how it is. Richard Atwood, former winner in those wonderful Porsche 917s. It's all happening down to this garage, folks. Well, in the meantime, you can hear by the roar that there's been a green given to the... I was going to say, there's such a long racetrack here. It's eight miles around. There's three pace cars, not just one. Now, the first group, the lead group, just got in the green, but these other people are not going yet. We'll have an updated story coming on about another problem that just occurred, too. But right now, the, there's the pace car pulling off. These guys getting their green. It's a hairy time, though. Let's not forget, Dorsey. I mean, these guys are now on cold tires. They've got brakes that aren't warm. And they're going out onto a track that's got cold oh, dust. Could be, it could be you know, a time car. to watch out very, very carefully. Well, we know why the pace car's out. We'll get to that later. There's a lot of oil on the track and oil dry. When these guys get to it, it's going to be just quite a skating rink. Um, that's for sure. And where the pace cars deploy from is where they go back to on. So they, it's just middle of that of the Molzahn. They just pull over and let the field go at this stage just to keep people from making up too much of an advantage. But interestingly, there's a third one that still sits there. Now, Dorsey, here's what you were talking about. Now, this is a very unfortunate situation. This is the Miracle Motorsports. You see that wheel nut fall up. There goes the wheel. Now, that car is an American-based car, one of our hopefuls to win in their class. Now, this being said, that's a small problem compared to what I think is about to happen. We'll get to that in a moment. The wheel takes off, no question about it. They're going to stop the uh, 34, park it along the side of the road, and then this. He's put it in reverse and backed all the way in the pit lane. And by the rules, if I understand them correctly, if you back up, you're disqualified. Now, that is absolutely the case. I'm afraid that uh, he obviously didn't read the rule book, and it's a very hairy procedure backing up at any time. And he'd be very, very lucky if he doesn't get to chuck down for that. Well, we've seen all these cars that have lost wheels, etc., limping around on flat tires, whatnot, limping around on three wheels to get back to the pits going forward. You cannot go into reverse without getting DQ'd, and I think we're going to find that is the case in the 34. Well, let's see if we can confirm that right now. Andrew? Yes, indeed, that's the case. Uh, Ian James was at the wheel. He's never been here to Le Mans, but his team manager, Mike Gouet, has been here before. He should have known about that. But then, it, you know, drivers under pressure do things they don't think. They don't engage brains sometimes. He obviously engaged reverse gear there. They are pushing the car back to the uh, garage area, but my understanding is exactly the same as Alan de Cadenet's. That car will be disqualified. Poor Ian James. He'll take this quite personally. You know, that, that car really doing a great job. Well, first sad. Here. Very sad. That's finger problem in the... The pits, I'm afraid. The guy with the uh, pneumatic hammer there obviously didn't get that nut screeched up so that the uh, safety pins, uh, either they, they don't put them in manual anymore because they fly out automatically. Well, obviously something went wrong and that wheel nut wasn't done up properly. Cost them uh, the, their exit from the race. Very this, sad. It, it has been a great experience for them to be here as you take a look at the, uh, the car and the wheel that came off. Remember in the ALMS series at uh, Mid-Ohio, the most recent race, they were running away with the class lead late in the race and Bucknum, one of the regular drivers, put in one minute and a half too much time in that car, and they were excluded at Mid-Ohio. It's been a rough month, month and a half for that team, but they've shown some great work. When we come back, highlights from the first few hours here at Lama. Speed Channel's live coverage of the Michelin 24 Hours of Lama is brought to you by Michelin, a better way forward. By new Mobile One Extended Performance, the oil that's changing oil. And by Porsche. Porsche, there is no substitute. And if for some reason you weren't able to catch the first few hours of programming, we've been bringing you live from Le Mans, we've got highlights for you from the start of the race up to the current point. And of course, the start of the race is one of the most spectacular moments in all of motorsport. And it certainly was here as the clock ticked four o'clock. Watch the move there by the Mugen Dome. Jumped up a position. The two Pescarolos in the front row started to open up a big lead. Things looking good for them at this point. For the number 64 Corvette, Oliver Gavin, a blown tire, got it back to the pits. Did a brilliant job, as a matter of fact. They fixed it. It worked fine. Later on, they would have another similar problem, however. 
The main competition for them in the pits, or excuse me, on the track, is the number 59 Aston Martin and the number 58 team car. Well, the 59 entry of Darren Turner, this was his second time off course. He was determined to have cut the course and ended up with not only a drive through penalty, but then later damage to the front splitter as a result of that off course excursion and an extended pit stop at that. On board, the number 17, Pescarolo Sohaila Yari, gets into the number 78, driven by Patrick Bourdais. It damaged the steering rack. It had to go into the garage for the number 78. Now Marino Frank, Marino Frank on board, locked up. Possible damage from that contact. But for Henri Pescarolo, enjoying the big lead for the 16 car. But that too was short lived. Gearbox problems. It came in, went straight back into the garage for another extended stop. That put the number two out up front in the hands of Ironman Emmanuel Piro, who ran some phenomenal and long stints. There was a full course caution that came out because of oil all over the track. And right before the restart, watch next to near frame, the number two Piro locked it up, went straight into the barrier in Arnage. It did some damage. They assumed that it was simply cold tires and not able to get going again. He was able to get back up. Then the 17 in the hands of Eric Hillary was running quite slowly on track and he was frustrated at the same time. Then the number four, this is the French Audi. This in the hands of Stéphane Ortelli had a run through the gravel trap. Then the number 52 BMS Scuderia Ferrari 550 Marinello, big spin between the Mulzahn corner and Indianapolis and got away with it a little bit. It was uh, hit the barriers, but not as hard as it could have. The speeds there are tremendous for these cars. Then we had the number 13. Now this is one of the hybrid cars. Bruce Jeanne perhaps making the save of the race. That left rear tire exploding, destroying the back of the car. Again in that same segment of track, very fast he managed to save it. Watch the number four. Look like perhaps the engine let go. Not the case. A problem in the right front corner of the car in the suspension or wheel bearing. It had to go back for a fix. And then the last caution caused by the 85 spiker in the hands of Tom Coronel. A huge oil fire. And it was substantial at that. So there you have it. And that was that uh, caution. You see the fire starting there. We have now, as we talked about, just gone back to green. Let's take a look now at our Mobile One race recap. The story, the Pescarolo started one and two. They're now, however, eighth and sixth. They're still fast, but perhaps fragile. The Audis, unbelievable. Number three, first overall, Tom Christensen behind the wheel. The second car right behind him, and Christensen going for his sixth straight, a record seventh if he gets it. An American team's leading in LMP2 and in GT2. And, of course, recently they were leading briefly in GT1 as well. So things going very, very well. And with the story in GT1, let's check in again with Andrew. Yeah, I'm with Ron Fellows here. Ron, this is the, turning out to be the mother of all battles against the Astons. Well, yeah, we just got to we got to keep it on the road. It's been uh, as, as hot as it's been, it, and the and the two cautions. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of debris get on the racetrack. I, I think probably because of the heat. There's been a couple of major motor failures all in the same place on the run down to Indy, and you, it's hard to see the oil. And uh, fortunately, the, the ACO has done the right thing. You know, when it's when it's greasy like that, and you really can't see it. Bring the pace car out, and it <laughs> saves us a lot of aggravation and <laughs> wrecked cars. Could be a long night. Could be a long night. Well, let's uh, let's. Uh, I think we're right around that summer solstice. So let's hope it's a short night. Yeah. Go on, fellas. Andrew, be for a short night. Andrew, tell him I'm up in the air-conditioned booth watching and right, rooting him on. He'll <laughs> like that. Did you see on his hat, by the way, celebrating 1960 to 2005? In 1960, Corvette had their fabulous run here. They came eighth overall, won the class, and that was John Fitch and Bob Grossman. And that's a kind of a very uh, epoch area in Corvette history, their first uh, victory here at the Mall. Absolutely. I, well, and you know, then, of course, a few years later, the Greenwood Corvettes, those just wild machines. I mean, it's been an interesting evolution of Corvette yeah. here. There was one of those here today in the vintage that did a display, one of the Greenwood Corvettes. Yeah, that's big right. Big huge, big block. Well, a, it, we did mention that uh, there was an American car leading the LMP2, that's with Liz Halliday, that's car number 32, driven by my uh, one of my neighbors as well, uh, Greg, Greg Fiskin, and they're doing really, really well. That's one of those brand new Lolas, the most excellent little car, and they're having a lovely run. And Sam Hancock, who's in that car, I spoke to him earlier. He said it's running better now than it's run since they got the car. It's just absolutely settled down beautifully. Temperatures and pressures are fine. So we're looking for a nice, strong finish. There was
as Henry Pescalero there taking a look at the number four uh, Audi pit stop, which looked pretty routine. And that is uh, Hugh Deschanak, who is watching his car go as we are now at seven and a half hours into the event, the Michelin Vancadour du Mans at the uh, Circuit de la Sarthe. And uh, that is the car right now, you would have to say, is carrying the French hopes. This is a gentleman who is long associated with Le Mans as well. And uh, that number four Audi, it's his program, the PlayStation Team Orica. It is all French drivers, and he is a, a French icon. And it's carrying the hopes right now, and it's not that far off, only two laps off the lead. Were yeah. you talking in tongues a moment ago? What was all that? Just trip, giving tribute to this that, that is a great. By the way, I, I mentioned earlier in our previous show that the the car that the French are running, the Eureka car, is in fact the self same vehicle that won Sebring in 2004. It's a well sorted machine, and it's got a great history. And there's still not too much in it. They're all within a couple of laps of each other. The race isn't even a third over yet. Exactly. Anything can happen here. I talked to the engineers at Audi. Of course, I drove one of these Audis, and I asked them how many were totally made. They wouldn't give us a specific number, but we know there were three generations of the Audi R8 made, all of them still in existence, and all of them either in private collector's hands or in museums or being raised for the last year. That's right. Well, it's been a remarkable run for the Audi uh, team, the Audi car, the R8, the whole story uh, since the R8 hit in particular in 2000 here. And it has been a phenomenal story. We, By the way, Alan was talking about what's been unfolding in LMP2, a category that in the past has sort of been the last one standing is the one that's going to win. This year, there's a lot of entries. There's some very well-subscribed cars in it, and there's a fabulous story that Alan alluded to that is building in the LMP2 category, uh, even with the promise for Miracle Motorsport in that American program for an American driver uh, with an American team still. Things are going very well indeed, so we'll be bringing you up to date on that. Meanwhile, here is our overall situation right now. Audi, Audi. Audi. Wednesday nights on speed. Step into the world of unique. Unique whips, that is. A custom auto body shop that turns the cars of the stars into one-of-a-kind works of art. Catch Unique Whips Wednesdays, 9 p.m., exclusively on speed. There's a very good look at the famed Rolex clock here that keeps everybody informed as to just what's unfolding out on the track. And... Uh, it is uh, it's a little it's early to look at early. that. Yeah, it certainly is. That's not going to do anything for another day. That right there is an LMP2 category car. That is one of the uh, the Belmondo Racing uh, Courage Fords. It's actually the AER engine, but uh, Ford of France has had a very long relationship with the team. And uh, so that's what we're looking at. There is J.J. Leto, who is about to be getting into his car. We were talking a little bit earlier. Let's see. This may be that is the number three Audi. Heading into the pit, so that should be Christensen bringing in and uh, turning over to Leto. Correct, you are. He is coming down that way. We saw J.J. putting on his balaclava, the fireproof mask that goes underneath the helmet, and, of course, then his helmet. This should be routine. Uh, you see J.J., how easy going he is. I mean, he's, he's not breathing hard. He's not even worked up about this. Been there, done that, obviously. Bring yeah. the tires out, and it does not necessarily mean they'll be making a change in those tires. Though. They probably will, but they can't do it until the fueling's done. All they can do while the man is fueling there is the two drivers assist each other in the driver change. And you see the cleaning of the windscreen as well. But you can't do the tires. You can't work on anything until that fueling rig is disconnected. Then they'll go to the tires if they're going to. You see the little pito tube sticking up by his arm there? That's the airspeed indicator. These cars actually read their own airspeed like aircraft. And these guys are so experienced at doing everything they do. You know, the crew, the drivers, they've all done this so many times. They are super well-oiled machinery themselves. Like I say, very routine. You'll see him disconnect the air hose. He'll put it on launch control. Away he goes. And he doesn't have to get sideways anymore because that's illegal. They'll, that's they'll pick point. you up on that. Remember in the old days, they used to gas it out the pits all over the place, dust and derision. Now, of course, they're not allowed to do that. They don't let you do anything fun anymore, really. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, you get in trouble for all kinds of things. That was a good chance for us to show off, wasn't yeah, it? We, yeah, that's right. A mega car control in first gear. There's Christensen right now. He looks a little bit sweaty, but not too much to worse for wear. 
he had to put in some pretty tough laps uh, earlier on uh, before we came back. Uh, he had uh, Mr. McNish in the uh, number two car chasing him and was really putting the pressure on trying to stay on that lap. And Christensen drove some uh, blinders. Tom, uh, sorry to get to you so quickly out of getting after the car. Very good stint and, uh, well, better than you expected, I think. Nah, but, I mean, <laughs> the car is, is really good. Champion brought us a fantastic car. Uh, obviously, it has all these uh, penalties. And to be honest, we were, um, we were expecting uh, it would take a much longer. If we would get in the lead, it would have to take longer. So a lot of things happened, obviously, early on. And uh, suddenly, we had a bucket which now we can only lose. And it happened very fast. The car, obviously, is, um, as always, hopefully, until now, very reliable. It's running well. There was a lot of incidents on track in terms of in terms of oil on the circuit and uh, made it very made it very difficult. And obviously, before I really enjoyed and I was very relaxed going into the race because uh, we were going out to race and if we did well, we could uh, only go forward. Now I feel more pressure. We are leading, so uh, in this sense, we have something to lose. Do you feel pressure because that big number seven starts to uh, come into your mind? No, not uh, not at all. We are in the lead of a Le Mans, and uh, numbers at the moment doesn't matter. What matters now is uh, the last race for Audi R8, and the first maybe for um, uh, the, uh, towards victory for champion racing. That's what we are aiming for. I'm thinking of nothing else. Tom, thank you very much. Thinking of nothing else, I wonder just how true that statement was. Uh, anyway, he's putting on a face. We've got a great graphic for you here. Look at the accomplishment that Christensen has. Derek Bell, five wins out of 26 attempts, uh, 0.192 a percentage. Jackie Eck, six wins in 50 attempts, 400. Christensen, six wins in eight. That's 750. And Alan, you and I were talking about this before that you can't really you can't really say that all things are equal back then versus now, but it really doesn't make any difference, does it? I mean, his accomplishments are what they are, which is quite remarkable because I can tell you, starting these races, you've got to be in the right team, you've got to be with the right drivers, and you've got to have a heck of a lot of, of luck. Well, Derek will tell you himself that uh, when he first started doing this race, he was in a, a fairly good car, but it wasn't the best. As soon as he got his bum into the best car next door to Jackie Hicks, he won it, and then he won it again. And I mean, we would all have felt at that time, huh, would like to have felt if we could have got our bum into the car next door to Jackie X, we might have won it too. Or got our bum into the same car that Derek Bell was in, we might have won it too. But it's, it's the luck of the draw. Christensen has definitely been in the right place at the right time, but he's also had the metal to get the job done. There's no point being the right place in the right time if you don't get the job done. Imagine that if he hadn't have won when he was sitting in the seats he was sitting in. And if one and time was, ever the Audi uh, was the wrong car to be in, it was looking like it was his time, Greg. That's exactly right. And once again, it pans out for Tom Christensen. So the luck factor certainly plays strongly as well. We're going to show you our class leaders at this stage. Christensen, uh, it's all Audi up front. Then uh, again, Liz Halliday, Gregor Fiskin, and Sam Hancock leading the Intersport Lola in the LMP2 category. In the GT division, it continues to be the Aston Martin bet battling, and it is the Aston Martin holding sway right now, and the two Porsches up front in GT2. When we come back, a little more about a tremendous French champion who's running here for the first time. Welcome back, everybody, once again to the 73rd running of the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans. It, uh, we are under full darkness, there's no question. There is Hugh uh, de Chenac once again, kind of monitoring the activities of his car, which currently sits in the third spot. Uh, we're going to give you some information we talked about. Uh, rally champions to race here at Le Mans, Gerard LaRousse, Vic Alford, Walter Rohrl, Bjorn Valdegaard, Colin McRae, and today, Sebastian Loeb. And what a story this has been. Of course, he was the champion in 2004 and uh, was just a remarkable story. Just absolutely hauling that Citroën through every conceivable condition without fear. Of course, that's kind of important in rallying and just phenomenal car control. Uh, you got to love that. It's a very special breed that goes out and rallies in these scenarios. And Sebastian Loeb certainly has been able to fulfill the uh, the requirements of being a world-class rallyer. And that snow looks exactly like someplace you would live. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> I wish I could go watch Sebastian drive through it. It is quite amazing to watch him toss this little Citroen all around. 
of course, putting life right on the line there with these trees and so forth. That's the difference between racing that type of a rally and what you do here, of course, taking these uh, laps, lap after lap. Much safer environment here on the racetrack. Very, wa very watchable stuff, isn't it? I've just been looking at that, but like with you guys have on the monitor, I mean, it's difficult to keep your eyes off it. The guy's a mega car control, isn't he? You see him celebrating. He's done plenty of that this year. As a matter of fact, just before the test day here at Le Mans, he won the Turkish Rally his fourth straight. So he comfortably leads the World Rally Championship right now after seven rounds. So it looks as though he may be well on his way to repeating the World Rally Championship for Citroën. He came here for the test day, promptly put in 12 laps, made the requirement easily enough. No worries there and uh, was relatively competitive. Everybody felt good about the fact he was going to be one of the drivers here uh, and that he was certainly competent. The question was, was he going to be quick enough to really match up to the other five drivers on the team? And it did take us real long to find out. Well, this is quite a lot easier, this style of driving, than uh, than the rally driving it is, because you keep using this race car to go lap after lap after lap. You memorize the racetrack, and you uh, you do it the same the way every time. In rallying, it's not the way it is at all. He's in a constant state of motion in that rally car. And, yeah. uh, and that just wears you out all the more. This is absolutely right. Now, Dorsey, this is relatively repetitive, providing things don't go wrong. Trouble I think where his skills will, skills will really come in is when uh, things do go wrong. That trouble on the left front, he just now gets the wheel nut off. And, of course, one of the issues, too, and we saw it in the morning warm-up, Alan, was that when he was out, he was throwing the car around quite a bit, and that's not that's not great on tires in this type of racing. That was one of the concerns for him. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think there's a lot of extra stress going into the car due to his driving style. But on the other hand, that's the way he does things, you know, and uh, he may have to just kind of learn to modify that slightly and just, uh, well, take it a little more easily. But the days of chucking these things around like that, all arms right. and legs and sideways, I'm kind of over. It's not the quick way to go, but he's still doing a remarkable job. Well, he had talked about earlier, he said that one of the differences was in the rally car, when you throw it into the corner, you got three differentials that are doing a lot of work for you. And he said, here, you, it's it's up to you to really control it. And of course, this now is footage from when he first got in the car earlier today. And at the top of the show, I posed the question, you know, he's very marketable here, bringing the French World Rally Champion to run with Henri Pescarolo's team. Wow, great story. How is he going to do the first question the first half of that was answered when he got out in race pace scenario he was running laps spot on with the other five drivers were doing 340 342s yeah. now we know they can run 334s don't know if he can do that yet but boy he has proven to be very very good he has adapted mega quickly because yeah. you think of the speeds that he does in his rally car it looks spectacular but they aren't mega fast i mean 110 20 miles an hour maybe Wow, he's, he's going a whole bunch quicker here in this car, and he's definitely adapted very, very quickly. There's one other real big difference, too, is that he doesn't have to worry about making his co-driver sick on him like you do in the rally car. That's very true, although his co-driver is plenty comfortable in that car, a former rally champion himself. You can see the guy grinning as they came across the line when most of us yeah. would be rather ill. I well, he rode. makes all his own decisions, too. He hasn't got anybody telling him go left, go right, flat out, whatever. You know, there's no there's no rally notes for this stuff. I rode co-driver in a rally, and uh, I can tell you without question, I cannot do it. It's, uh, I, got me, I got very sick. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, you got it's a special breed that well, can sit alongside there like that and you talked about this being compared to rally is is of course fairly repetitive but the thing is if you're driving very fast it may be repetitive in terms of the same corner same straight and all that but the car's stepping out it's doing all kinds of things every lap is a new adventure yeah. when you're driving at these speeds and and uh, on the edge and the whole car setup too where you you basically are using your brake in a rally car to change its direction and encourage the car to brake away which is what you're looking for it to do huh. the last thing on earth you want is for this thing to start breaking away at the kind of speeds they're doing well, and to give you an idea of just how well he did, we talked about the lap times that he was turning very, very close to, as a matter of fact, almost spot on to what the other members of the team were doing. That car is now in the 17th spot, or excuse me, the 17 car is in the fifth spot. So your top five for that car with him behind the wheel, you wouldn't be there if he was really struggling to go quick. So obviously he is doing an absolutely phenomenal job. Now we are back to some live images. Joao Barbosa sitting in the car right now, uh, getting work done, hopefully to get back out there and get in battle again. Yeah, they've got a problem there with the power steering, and they're having to continually top the power steering reservoir up with fluid because it's piddling out, and that's causing them quite a lot of problems, uh, especially when um, uh, 
MP6 is in the car because basically she needs all the help she can get from the uh, power steering. And it's been a problem that they were running as high as second at one point before that problem cropped up. And I think they turned over now to Martin Short, who was the uh, endorser. You're just pointing him out on the screen. He's the uh, team owner, one of the yeah. team owners, but a very, very solid driver. Oh, he's a good man, I can tell you. No doubt about that. Not only does he uh, own the team, he works in the team, and then he jumps in and drives the darn thing. I mean, he's a jack of all trades. And uh, uh, probably any person in the whole race that's doing that. And they've just brought one of the number... Uh, the number 24, Volta Racing Peugeot out on the track. The number 83, Cycle Motorsports Porsche. A quick spin. The activity continues. And here's your top six overall at Le Mans. Welcome back to Michelin 24 Hours Le Mans. I'm with Andy Wallace. Andy, you've been playing catch up in this uh, DBA car. I had a big problem earlier on. Yeah, we had a couple of problems. One was a gear selection problem. Um, another one was, I think it was a, a leak, a water leak. So we had an overheating problem. So we lost about 10 laps. Um, since then, the car's been running quite well. Although out there, there was a couple of accidents out there and a lot of um, quick drive the oil that was left. And of course, the lights get covered in oil and uh, you don't see very much. So I also picked up, uh, probably from a stone or something, I picked up a slow puncture on the left front. So the car was hitting the ground quite hard for the last sort of three quarters of an hour, which is a bit uncomfortable. After all your recent victories, is it difficult to motivate yourself when you're sort of down in 13th, 14th place? Well, the, the thing with the 24-hour race is it's never over till it's over, and there's a long way to go. And, and you already saw the Pescarolos hit trouble early on. Um, if we don't hit any more trouble, we'll find our way back up. We're at least on the first page of the TV screen now. We're on the third page when we had our problems. So you don't give up, you just keep going. Thanks very much, Andy, and thanks for being patient. That's a driver who knows of what he speaks when it comes to endurance racing. Uh, not only has he won here, of course, uh, he is he's one of the few to have won the big three uh, in its day. Of course, now the, the fourth one would, would be the Petit, but I mean Sebring, Daytona, here, yeah. he's won them all. He's a lovely old bloke, actually, Andy Wallace, and uh, he goes back a long way. Thoroughly professional. I mean, surprisingly fit, actually. I mean, uh, you know, it's easy to get out of shape to get a bit older, huh, don't we all know? But uh, he's just, as I said, he's a lovely old bloke, and he's, he'll do the best job possible for this team, or, in my opinion, any team he ever drives for. He always gives his 100%. He's one of the fine gentlemen I had the privilege of being able to share cars with over the years. Uh, Andy, a great guy. He is a never-say-die guy. There's no question about it. He will not give up. He's like a bulldog. He just keeps digging. I kind of like that. We were on the third page of the TV screen when we started. <laughs> hey, we're on the first page now. That's optimism. That's progress, yeah. By the way, the car we uh, just watched make its way out of the pit lane. The number 30, Cruza Motorsports, Kurai C65, fifth in the LMP2 division. And it was a car that made its debut in the proto. It's a team that's been around for a little bit. They specialize in running the 24-hour uh, races and the Endurance Series. That runs exclusively at the Nordschleife, the Nürburgring in Germany. And uh, Kai Kruza, the young driver and team owner of that team, Got a little help, decided to try a prototype, and they put one on the track. It's been a teething problem. They're short on funding, as uh, the story often is, but they've been doing a great job with Phil Bennett, Ian Mitchell, and Tim Mullen. And uh, as we speak of that, you can take a look and see that they're sitting right there in that fifth spot. That was from our French host feed. We appreciate that. And uh, meanwhile, one of the uh, the top cars uh, from the team that qualified on the LMP2 pole, that is the Courage Ford entry, that from uh, Paul Belmondo Racing is behind the wall. So uh, at, this class has really come alive this year at Le Mans. It's been fairly big in the last couple of years in the European Endurance Series, but it's come alive here and it's coming alive in the States. A lot of damage there to the front splitter area. If you've got a, you see it there right on the right front. It looks like he's been off the road. You see all the stones and rubber that have been taken out from underneath the car all lying around in the garage floor right there. All right, well, let's check in with Chris Neville. We've been talking about this LMP2 category. The current leader is the number 32 Intersport entry. Chris? That's right, Greg. Liz Halliday behind the wheel in that car. These guys have been problem-free all day long, and that's what's keeping them up front. You, when you check in with a lot of these LMP2 cars, if they're running problem-free, they're running at the front. And these guys are really happy with the performance they've seen with Liz all day long. Right now, she's in for a single stint, so we should probably see her back in here, maybe within the next hour or so, and hopefully we can talk to her. She's Excellent. driving very well, you know, guys, Liz. I mean, she's turning consistent 401s, 42s. 
I mean, that's what you want here, just consistent stuff. You don't want to go frightening your timekeepers in your box there. Just keep doing nice times. That's what she's doing. A really, really nice job. I, th I think she's a remarkable story because, uh, you know, she's a top-notch equestrian. She came to England to train with uh, the gentleman who won the silver medal uh, and, and was a groomer for him. But she got involved in sports car racing. She's running a Lister Storm in the FIA GT Series, which is no mean piece of equipment. But this is her first time ever in a prototype, and she's running in the lead. Yeah, well, she's doing very well. I mean, I think uh, her country can be proud of her. Yeah, so absolutely. Trained in England, guys. Trained in England. Okay. okay. All the American drivers, guess who's on top? Liz Alday leading right now in her class. Part of the problem with these little cars, and I say little cars, they're not really all that small, but they're very light. And with the lightness, they have to be built to, uh, to a, a bit of a brittle spec, you might say. And well, it's not that Le Mans is a, is a rough course like we've seen in the United States, particularly Sebring, but uh, they, tend to, uh, they tend to shake pretty badly. It's, it's like a billiard table, this place, as you know. I mean, it really is super smooth. But uh, Martin Bahrain, who owns Lola Cars, has put a fortune into the development of this car. And they've been very smart. They've gone along and bought the car, had it kitted out for the engine package that they wanted to use. And they've set it up so that it's easy to drive. They've got a great driver, Sam Hancock, who does kind of all of that. And then his co-drivers, Gregor Fiskin and Liz Halliday, well, they take over, and, and it's, it's easier to drive because it's been set up well. All right, and our second place overall entry, Frank Bila in the Champion ADT Audi, makes its way down into pit lane. And boy, these cars have just been running like a juggernaut, with the one exception, this car, the off by Puro. Otherwise, things have been going great. Looks like Bila's going to stay on board. That's what we've come to expect, really, out of Audi, isn't it? I mean, now that they've taken some of the... Uh, power away from it and so forth. There's no reason to believe it wouldn't be as reliable as it was before, if not more reliable. Uh, and like you say, Bila had a little off there. We got into some oil at, at uh, Arnage and went straight on. There's nowhere to go straight on there and did a little damage. But uh, since that point in time, it's just been routine, as you can see right here. And yeah. as we get into the night and, and with the double, maybe even triple standing of drivers and tires, these uh, these stops, particularly for the Audi team, have become rocket quick. So uh, it's been fascinating to watch. We're going to step away for just a moment, but when we come back, we're going to spend a moment or two with the president of the America Le Mans series. Tomorrow, Speed Channel presents Formula One. It's the United States Grand Prix from the legendary Brickyard. Men and Machine will pitch into battle for four-wheel supremacy. This is where great racers become heroes. Formula One, the U.S. Grand Prix, tomorrow live at 1.30 Eastern, 10.30 Pacific, exclusively on Speed. And some fabulous developments uh, going on at Indianapolis right now. Here's a big one. The number 32 class-leading LMP2 leader makes a stop. And... Uh, Liz Halliday, it looks like she's going to continue on board, so she's putting in uh, some serious driving and some serious stint time right now in the cool of the evening and doing a very nice job indeed, continues to have that car placed uh, in the lead. And there's a good look at Liz from our host broadcaster. As we have talked about, the uh, tire technicians from Goodyear taking a look. Apparently they uh, like what they see. Well, I don't know about the cool of the night. I just walked outside for a moment. It's still probably in the middle 80s here and quite humid, so... Uh... She's doing a great job to a double. That's that's a yeah. good stamina there. And they got four laps on the next uh, car in the LMP2 class. And the car looks great from here. I mean, uh, really is in fine shape. Just got to keep it on the black stuff for another, uh, what, 16 hours. <laughs> well, they are checking something at the back of that car right now. But the mechanic looked like he signaled. It looks to be OK. Liz has fired it up, selected the gear on the paddles, and making sure not to spin the tires as she makes her way out. Again, continuing to lead in the LMP2 division. In the GT2 division, uh, the number 71 team has been having just a fabulous run, starting with their qualifying run. Chris Neville, what's going on? Greg, down here with Alex Job. Alex, you've had so much success in America in the GT program. Also, two years ago, you won this class working in conjunction with White Lightning. Now you're working in conjunction with BAM this weekend. Everything going well so far? Yeah, it's going very well so far. Uh, you know, we're running the fastest pace, but, you know, that's with our two uh, shoe drivers. You know, we've got one a little bit off the pace, but, you know, right now we're running double stints during the night with the two quick guys and try to pick up a little bit of a lead if, uh, if we don't, unfortunately, lose it in a yellow. 
couple of the other Porsche teams have been having some problems here today. You really don't expect that that's going to happen, but you guys are really taking advantage of that situation. Yeah, we've had a really clean run so far. No problems whatsoever, but it's a long race. You never know. But, uh, you know, Peterson guys have had a clean run, too, so it's uh, close racing right now. Well, Mike Rockefeller and Leo Hendry right now are asleep. Mark Lee behind the wheel, so these guys having a real clean run, keeping it on point. Having an exceptional run. Meanwhile, uh, Chris, the number five entry, the Japanese Dome, is in. It is, came in in fourth spot and is having a great run. And it is Seiji Ara, of course, one of the defending race winners from last year overall with the Team Go Audi, find the wheel of that car. The number eight car, that is... Uh, one of the Delar is this the Nissan Turbo entry that uh, missed the first 12 laps of the race or thereabouts while they uh, put in an engine has obviously had an off that car is just covered in dust and debris driver out they're going to back it into the garage we also saw some shots of the number 17 Pescarolo that had an off and uh, had some damage to the front end in the garage so all these developments continue meanwhile here comes Corvette down into pit lane making a scheduled stop, the number 64 entry in the hands of the extremely talented, capable Olivier Beretta. You look at the, uh, it looks like damage to the left rear, it's really not, he's had two flat tires, you see all that black rubber marks all over, no body damage, that's a testament to the strength of the bodywork and the strength of the fit of this body on the Corvette as it's had two tires just flail the side yeah. of it. it. It worried me because it was the left rear each time and so I immediately thought about that same problem that we saw in other cars at Sebring where something was scraping the sidewall of the tar but it hasn't been that at all so they're in the clear now I think. This should be just a routine pit stop. Well as it is now we have both of them in there of course they are number one and two in class. This is scheduled for both cars and uh, I don't see anything out of the routine there. And there's the second car making its exit. Uh, remains Beretta and Johnny O'Connell in the 64 and 63, respectively. They leapfrog to the class lead because of a stop by the 58 Aston Martin, driven by Thomas uh, Enge. And uh, right now, uh, we would suspect that uh, Tomas might pick the lead up again as a result of the cycling of the pit stops. And uh, currently, though, sits in third. When we come back, we are going to hear from the man who makes the Aston Martin program work, Mr. Dave Richard. So don't stay away too long. Hey, buddy. What you got there? Donuts. Oh. Wind, tunnel, wind tunnel with Dave Despain, your vehicle to let your opinion be heard. Wind tunnel tomorrow live at 9 Eastern only on speed. And let's head right down to the Aston Martin pits with Andrew Marriott. Uh, yes, I'm with the big boss himself, Dave Richards. Dave, ju just before uh, we came over to you, saw you on the pit wall timing the Corvette pit stops. Uh, are they good? Well, we just want to get a comparison, see where we are. We can run actually one lap longer than they can, it would appear. So we can go to 14 without stopping on fuel, and they're one lap shorter. So slight advantage for us there. This is something of a dream program, two races, two wins. Uh, you took a car that a lot of people thought wasn't a racing car and made it into a fantastic racing car. Yes, it's quite an exciting race here. As, as you see, we're eight hours in, it's still a minute or less than a minute apart, so it's shaping up to be quite a battle. Dave, out in the uh, paddock is the cup car. The, the, uh, Say again? Out in the paddock's that cup car. Are you gonna are you gonna sell that to customers? What's the story with that? Well, the, the other car we built, we decided that the GT1 cars are very expensive for car for private competitors, and yet we've got many Aston friends around the world who'd love to go racing. So we built a car for them. It'll be available at the beginning of next season, and um, it looks like being very popular already. Just switching to rallying quickly, we've got Sebastian Loeb doing a good job. I mean, they're all rounders, aren't they? Well, they are. I think uh, they seem to be having a few problems at that end of the pit lane. At the Pescarolas, but um, no, clearly it's a, a foreign environment for him to get into a car like this. He's obviously very good at it. As a former world champion uh, rally co-driver, he's staying up all night? Oh, I'll be up all night. I don't think I could go to sleep watching this battle <laughs> un unfold as the hours go on. And of course, as the sun comes up tomorrow morning, it gets hotter. That's when I think the pressure will really start to bear on the drivers. Dave, thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, I think as we watch the uh, Orica Audi in the pits, I think Dave Richards just opened up uh, something very, very important to this race in terms of this battle. They can go 14, and he thinks the vets can only do 13. That's huge. Yeah, yeah, they may have to do that. They're, you know, also, they're, bits of, they're very fastest time that they set in practice. The Astons was done on Michelin's super hard tire. They did a 350. Uh, they can up their pace if they, if they want to. 
I mean, there's no doubt about that. So the, the race is just over a third old, and he's a crafty old uh, wily fellow, is our Dave Richards. He'll be watching everything very, very closely. He also hit on another point that is a very key point in my way of looking at things, and that is when that sun comes up tomorrow, these guys will have half a day of work under their belt, and it's going to be into the upper 90 or mid-90s again tomorrow with high humidity. But once you've run one whole night, you go through that heat cycle, you're very hot during the day, then you're shivering at night because of the sweat that you have on you, then you come back into the heat the next day, it really takes it out of you. And we're going to see which of these teams has got the fittest drivers. Yeah, definitely. I think it could boil down to that, you know, who's the survival of the fittest. Old Darwin's going to come into this race after all. Let's get down to Chris Neville, who's got this pit stop for us. Greg, down here, TT2, second place. Timo Bernard handing over the duties to the very tall Jörg Bergmeister. These boys were so fast in practice and qualifying. Now, Jörg tried to qualify this car, but got in a bit of a wreck in the first qualifying session, which put this car back in the garage, and they actually had to go to another facility to uh, work on the front clip of this car. It was such a, a massive crash that he had. So they uh, lost a lot of time in prepping the car, but right now, everything seems to be running pretty good. Talked with Patrick Long earlier, and he said the car was a little bit loose, so they uh, don't think they have as, as good a car as they had hoped. But other than that, besides the wreck, things seem to be going pretty strong for these guys. So they're just trying to keep the pace up. And right now, great pit stop for these guys. Andrew? Unscheduled pit stop for the 32 car. Liz Halliday's just pulled the car in again after only three laps. They put a fresh set of rubber on the car. And they've also been shaking the front suspension around. And they've downloaded from the laptop. And now it looks like the rear deck's coming off. So there, it appears there is a problem here. And right at the moment, I can't give you any more than that. But uh, I'll come back within just a moment. All right, Andrew, the last time we saw her in, they were looking at, at the back of the car underneath and then gave the OK signal. Uh, obviously, that problem a little bit deeper than we thought. And uh, hearing about that stop for GT2, what a battle we have unfolding there uh, in that category. And uh, the number three is in, J.J. Leto coming in. The last stop they did was a one as on lap 119. This is lap 126. So uh, not going all that far at this stage. Uh, very routine, just tire or fuel only. Well, surprisingly, they didn't wipe off the uh, headlight covers, which were completely covered in oil, so it's going to be very hard for them to see. That's, uh, I think, maybe a miscue. They could have done that very quickly. Yeah, they were so anxious to get him back out there, they left that out. And there's something quite serious going on there as well. I mean, the, she's obviously reported a vibration or a handling malady. Maybe it's difficult for her to hang on to the wheel. Something's gone amiss. Uh, maybe the tracking's gone out or something. They found out that between practice and their checkup that they got a whole tracking malady on that car. It had towing that it shouldn't have, and it also had rogered a rose joint at the back there, which had lost its bearing surface. So, hey, it could be something like that. I don't know. Well, whatever it is, it appears certainly to be quite serious. I think it's interesting that the Audi pitted after only seven laps, so uh, well uh, short of their window. Here are the class leaders at this stage. We've talked certainly about LMP1, LMP2 might be up for debate at this stage with the problems here for the number 32. In GT1, the battle between the Vets and the Aston Martins continue, but in GT2, those two cars, the 90 and the 71, switching the lead at every stop. Very close. The uh, champion team here as the number four French team moves. Watch the wing right there. Just got out of the way. That, folks, is our mobile one move of the race. And it was a great piece of uh, saving it right there without a question. Let's get down to Chris Neville to uh, finish up a story that uh, has uh, developed earlier and had some problems as of late. Chris? Greg, just wanted to update you on the two panels running in GT2. Officially, the 77 has withdrawn motor problems early on, so that car is out. And the 78 was brought into the garage about a half an hour ago with a clutch problem. They've been working on the car diligently. It looks like that problem is about fixed, so they're hoping to get the 78 back out into competition, but it is it is well back. These boys were hoping to put some pressure on the Porsches here in the GT2 class, but things just haven't gone their way from the get-go. Well, for the Panos uh, team, obviously, this is uh, coming to Le Mans for the first time uh, with a brand new car, essentially, to the program is a learning experience, and they're doing that. But let's not forget that tremendous win at Road Atlanta. They have shown, and their performance in qualifying, they have shown the speed, and they can get the reliability there. They are certainly going to be a force to be reckoned with. Well, definitely. I think what they can do now is just practice 
in 2005 for 2006. I mean, that's what we all used to do. If you broke down early in this thing, you got it all going again, and then you tried a whole bunch of things that you might use next year. It's the only place you can do it. Well, it's half past midnight here at Le Mans. We have a long, long way to go. We've seen a lot of attrition so far, and uh, I don't think we've seen anything yet, Greg. Not at all. 15 and a half hours plus remaining. Here is your top six uh, overall. And the big story right now would have to be Christensen at this stage, again, early on, well placed to get that sixth win in a row, the record seventh, and take it away from Hicks. Just an amazing development if that would happen. But we've got some great activity in LMP2. The battle in GT1 and GT2, both those classes, incredibly close, especially in GT2. So what you're going to want to do is come back when we do 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Our coverage live from Le Mans will continue. Uh, we also want to remind you, coming up next is going to be Speed News Saturday. So tune in to get a lot of information, including developments at Indianapolis for Formula One. So make sure you tune in there as well. At this stage, we're going to bid you adieu for just a little while. For Chris Neville and Andrew Marriott, Dorsey Schrader and Alan DeCadney, I'm Greg Creamer. Look forward to you joining us when we come back a little bit later at 7.30 p.m. Join us then, won't you? Carnival continues here at Circuit de la Sarp as we welcome you back to the 73rd running of the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans, the world's most significant, most special sports car race. It happens once a year, and that's why it is so very, very special. Welcome back, everyone. Lee Diffie along with Dorsey Schrader, Calvin Fish and Brian Till. The race is edging towards 10 hours old. We're creeping agonizingly close to the halfway mark and so much has happened already and it's very good news for the Pompano Beach Florida-based team, the ADT champion Audi organization. There's a lot on the line for Dave Mirage and his men because they are trying to become the first American team to win overall since 1967, the combination of Dan Gurney and AJ Foyt in their Ford many, many years ago. Well, look at that. Tom Christensen, the man who's driving for ADT champion Audi, he is going for an unprecedented seventh overall Le Mans victory. And his car, along with JJ Leto, Marco Werner, leads this race at the moment over the sister car of Frank Bieler, Manuele Piro, and Alan McNish. And to many people's surprise, the Dome Mugen, the all Japanese entry of Ara, Mishigami, and Kanishi, is sitting third, the highest it's been since the very first lap of the race. So a great effort there. Some sadness, though, in, L in LMP2 for the American Intersport team. It was being led by Gregor Fiskin, American Liz Halliday, and Englishman Sam Hancock. However, they have slid down the order. The car is pit-bound and is going nowhere for the moment. So the Paul Belmondo Racing Organization is leading. However, there is a positive note because American Rick Sutherland, who won the P2 class last year, is in the top spot in that class. Let's talk production cars for a moment. GT1, there is a fascinating battle going on there between the Aston Martin and the two sister Corvettes. At the moment, the Aston Martin DB9 of Enger, Cox and Lamy has the upper hand. But I tell you what, Ollie Gavin, Olivier Beretta, Jan Magnussen, 
they are really fighting hard against the sister car as well of fellows O'Connell and Pappas. Those cars have not been separated by more than a pit stop. What I mean by that is they exchange the lead every time they come in to get the regular service. One or the other of them takes the lead from the other. That's been a fantastic battle. GT2, we have uh, American team there with the 71, Lieb and Hendry and, and uh, Mike Rockefeller right in the car right now driving that. Over the 90, this is a great battle in GT2. Bergmeister, Patrick Long, and uh, Patrick Bernard in that. Yeah, well, the thing is, is it's great showing for American Le Mans Series teams. And in GT2, two of them in the top two positions. And, of course, Romar Dumas, who competes in the ALMS, his car, he's driving for Raymond Narak here at the Le Mans 24-hour. He sits third. Timo Bernard is who I was talking about. <laughs> I was looking at a different <laughs> note off to the side there. Tim, we're doing a great job today. It has been an eventful nine and a half hours so far, Dorse. Let's take a look at what has happened thus far. If you haven't been able to join us, we will bring you up to date right now. Look at the Dome Mugen dive on the inside of Emanuele Piro. Great stuff there, but a great start by the two Pescarolo Sport Juds. They skipped away to a handy lead. However, Oliver Gavin for Team Corvette suffered the first of what was to be two flat left rear flats and that caused some concern for the Corvette team. Of course, they haven't had any trouble since, and Ali did a good job. Watch here, a little air time, as the 59 Aston Martin does the shovels of gravel. That's the second time he's been off course in a row. He gets a lengthy penalty and has to change the splitter as a result. Yeah, it was Darren Turner. He had two stop and goes. The team was not happy with that. Darren Turner didn't think he was doing anything wrong. Now, take a look at this. Patrick Bourdais gets thumped by one of the Pescarolo sport cars with Sahail Ayari behind the wheel. It forced that car to go into the pits as well. And here, Patrick Bourdais once again spins, goes off into the gravel trap. And the watchful eye of Henri Pescarolo. He has so much on the line coming into this event. Both cars, both Pescarolo Judds spent time in the pit box. For this car, it was a gearbox problem, and they were leading healthily up until then. However, the two ADT champion Audi then took the front with Emanuele Pirro. And can you believe it? Pirro stayed out there for in excess of three hours, and per perhaps it was costly, because take a look at this at Arnage. Emanuele ran straight on, crunched into the tyre barrier, and that forced the R8 into the pits. It was lengthy, not too costly though, and Alan Mingish took it back out after that. Problems continued for the 17. And look at this, Eric Ellery, very frustrated with damage to that car, and that forced them back into the pits. Ortelli behind the wheel of the Team Orica R8. And a slight spin was able to get back on, but take a look at this, Tony Seiler in the BMS Scuderia Ferrari 550. Crunch, crunch, a double whammy. He was able to get that car back to pit lane though, and that was good work. Bruce Schuani in the Courage. Talk about driver control. Great work to hang on to that, and was able to continue and bring that car back to the pits as well. However, the problems continued for the all French combination for Team Orica PlayStation. It was not a blown engine, however, just damage to the front right. And these guys have just returned to the track now. And then the Spiker Squadron. They had their fair share of problems as well as it went up in a ball of flames. There has been so much going on in this first nine and a half hours. Whew. As you can see, problems continuing here. This is in the P2 cab for Ray Malik Limited as they wheel it back in, and that car had just climbed onto the podium in the LMP2 class. What a day. Trials and tribulations in the P2 class. One driver who was at the head of that was American Liz Halliday. We will talk to her when we return. Each Wednesday at 8pm it is build or bust. Anyone can ride a bike, but only a few have the guts to build a custom chopper from the ground up. One novice bike builder, one custom chopper, and 30 days to build or bust. See if they can do it. Wednesday nights at 8pm Eastern, right here on Speed. Clock keeps on ticking, doesn't it? It counts down. Just over 14 hours to go, almost 10 down here in France at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Let's talk about our first production-based class, GT1. Fierce battle here, but it went the wrong way for Ollie Gavin in the Corvette. Flat rear left tyre, 
Fortunately, there was no body damage. They were able to get a new tyre on and send him without losing too much time. However, believe it or not, it happened again. We'll show you that in a moment. Problems for the then class leader in the Aston Martin DB9. Darren Turner ran off at the PlayStation chicane. And not too much harm done, but this was the second of two stop-and-go penalties. However, this was an extended one. They made him stay for a little longer. Gavin handed over to Olivier Beretta. Beretta experienced the same problem and again escaped with no body damage to the C6R. Very lucky there. However, for the sister Aston Martin of Cox, Enger, Lamy, they just keep charging on and they are still our GT1 class leaders. But the Corvette boys, they are taking the fight to them. They have led the class at various stages and Brian Till is right there with them. Well, Lee, motor racing, they say, is a lot like poker. And one of the guys I think who could probably win the World Series of Poker is Doug Feehan. He's the project manager here at Corvette Racing. Doug, everything going the way it needs to go for you? I think we're pretty pleased with the way everything's going, Ryan. Uh, I think we got them right where we want them. Cars are running uh, exactly as we had planned. Uh, tire wear is exactly the way it should be. Brake wear, fuel mileage, uh, everything's running really, really well. And we just had Tommy Kendall in the booth, and the guys were talking to him a little bit. Obviously, you know Tommy very well. He said it just looks like the Aston Martins have the legs, though, and he feels like that this race goes to the Swift. What do you have to say about that? Well, well, well I think if the race was uh, only 10 hours long, there'd probably be some credence to what Tommy has to say. But if he can stay awake for 24 hours, maybe he'll have a little surprise for him at the end. Well, one of the things that's difficult around this racetrack, being over eight miles, is communication. And I hear you guys have a, a really cool race radio system that nobody else in the paddock has. We're very fortunate to have a great partnership with Motorola, and uh, Motorola has gone to great lengths to ensure the fact we've got continuous communication all around the circuit. We have a couple of radio towers that are built inside the circuit at various points. We have repeaters placed all over. We have some broadband communication stuff, so it's, uh, it's a pretty sophisticated communication system. We're lucky to have Motorola on board. So the days when, back in the olden days, when like Calvin and I used to drive and we could complain and say, oh, well, we just didn't hear you on the radio. The drivers don't have that excuse anymore. What? <laughs> I told you I wouldn't want to play poker with this guy. Lee? Well, you know what? We hear that these uh, radios that he's using are so elite that only the military have them. And so I'm thinking that maybe he can call an airstrike down against the Aston Martin as we have the lead. Number three, Audi, ADT champion Audi is on pit lane. Looks to be a routine uh, pit stop. No trauma here yet. JJ Leto behind the wheel. The Finn doing another sterling job. And of course, one of the three drivers in this car is six-time Le Mans winner Tom Christensen. He is going for an unprecedented seventh. He can eclipse Jackie X's record. And so far, so good. And a lot of people say Christensen has been in the right cars at the right time and he has some luck. But I tell you what, this team has not put a foot wrong all day. Dave Mirage's man, it could be a wonderful double win for them if Christensen can get the seventh and Dave Mirage's men can become the first American team to win since 1967. And you see there the pit stop for the number 58, Aston Martin. Pedro Lamy taking that car in for another very routine and very fast stop. And there goes the Corvette sweeping right around the outside. So that battle continues to rage. Aston Martin v Corvette, it's been fabulous stuff. Just want to update you in GT2. It's great for the American teams there because leading the way is the 71 Alex Joe Bam collaboration. Mike Rockefeller is leading from fellow American Le Mans Series racer Patrick Long for the Peterson White Lightning team. And those guys are going for their third consecutive win. The team that is, Long and Bergmeister going for their second consecutive. And almost, it's almost a three-peat we have got the Flying Lizards back and forth trying to get up into the top three. Cal. Well, David Brabham brings the number 59 Aston Martin in. Obviously, they're trying to climb back from those penalties that Darren Turner had earlier in the race. Right now, it looks like fuel only. I don't anticipate a tire change here. David is getting a fresh water bottle in the car, so obviously these cars cool down a little bit in the nighttime hours, but still extremely hot. You get that heat soak through the car that just seems to get worse and worse from a driver's perspective as the race goes on. So these boys seem to be losing just a couple of seconds on the pit stops to the Corvette. Oh, a good clean stop moments ago his teammate Pedro Lama who's leading the event right now in GT1 was in and that was a routine stop also fuel only and they're double stinning these Michelin tires Lee. They are a slick machine. The Aston Martin DBR9 
you hear that V12 talk to you? That's yeah. what I'm talking about. I saw something in the headlights of the cars out there, though, that's a bit disturbing, which was a lot of gravel on the racetrack. Someone obviously has gone off and come back on. And that is the kind of thing that causes the punctures that we see on uh, that we saw in the Corvettes earlier and so forth. Eric Comas waiting, waiting for his shot, waiting to climb on board. And the 16 Pescarolo Sport Judd has climbed its way back up into fourth place. It was the pole sitting car. It's been the fastest car all week. However, it's had its fair share of problems, most notably gearbox issues that set it tumbling down the order. And look at the oil on the windscreen. This car has been following somebody in close proximity who has got a substantial either rear end grease leak or oil leak. And you can see what it does to the driver. He cannot see. And if they don't do a little better job on the cleaning there, he's still not going to be able to see. I've told you about the overall standings. And in GT1, this is how it looks. Aston, Corvette, Corvette, Aston. Can't ask for more than that. We'll tell you more about Aston Martin when we return. Welcome back to Le Mans, the number 63. Corvette driven by Italian Max Pappas is in. Routine stop here. They're actually single stinting the Michelin tires. I just spoke to Steve Cole, the engineer. They're switching to the medium tire here for the nighttime hours as the cooler conditions prevail here. The tires can certainly go a little bit softer. So Max is doing a tremendous job here. The crew is really on fire here tonight. Another great stop by Danny Mix and the boys. And they are really putting the squeeze on the Aston Martin DBR9 of Pedro Lamy. If you were with us earlier, we spoke with ProDrive main man David Richards, and he said, how could you go to bed when this thrilling battle is on? And he had a wry smile. He said, I think we might have them, though, but there is still such a long way to go. Another 14 hours left to run here at Circuit de la Sarthe, the Michelin 24 hours of Le Mans. And speaking of the Aston Martins, the sight of two DB badge cars once again screaming around this fabulous circuit is sure to bring any Aston Martin fan back to a magical year, 1959. It was a season that proved wonderful for the works team from Gaydon, England. Le Mans in the 1950s was dominated by Jaguar, whose C&D types had outrun the competition five of nine tries approaching decade's end. Aston Martin was there throughout, initially with the DB2 and then the DB3S, which had three times finished runner-up. Aston Martin boss David Brown had been hard at work by 1956 designing and developing the DBR1, a purpose-built racing machine that would ultimately bring victory at Le Mans to Aston Martin. 1959's running was the fourth and final crack at the French Classic for the DBR1 under the factory banner. And by then, the strength of competition had shifted from Jaguar to Ferrari. A trio of three-litre Testarossas from the Scuderia comprised the stiffest opposition, but Aston Martin was prepared, entering three DBR1s with a driver slate that included Sterling Moss and Texan Carroll Shelby. The strategy from team manager John Wire was for Moss and Jack Fairman to push hard from the start in hopes of breaking the quicker Ferraris. It worked, but at a cost. Moss sprinted from the start and led the first hour. Fairman took over, kept up the pace, but pitted with an oil pressure problem by stint's end. The DBR1 then quit with a broken valve on Moss's outlap. John Bearer and Dan Gurney had taken the bait, and their Ferrari now led. It was short-lived, however, as Gurney ground to a halt about quarter distance. The pace had taken its toll and ultimately proved too much for the big Italian 12-cylinder. The Roy Salvadori Carroll Shelby Aston inherited the lead and held it over the Phil Hill Ferrari throughout the night. At dawn, however, Salvadori felt a strange vibration. After multiple stops, the source was finally found. Metal debris had torn into a rear tyre, gouging out large chunks. Meanwhile, Hill and Jean de Bien had inherited the lead, but shortly, they too would have their own trouble. About noon, Jean de Bien pitted with erratic oil pressure. A few laps later, he returned to the track, but severely crippled, enough that Shelby had no problem regaining Aston's position at the front. Jean de Bien then promptly retired. With four hours remaining, Salvadori and Shelby had simply to finish. The third DBR1 of Maurice Trintignon and Paul Frere had by now safely slotted into second spot with a brace of privateer Ferraris 25 laps in arrears. John Wire's brilliant scheme had worked to perfection as Carroll Shelby had the honour of taking the chequered flag at exactly 4pm. Aston Martin had finally done it. Victory at Le Mans. <laughs>
What a fabulous achievement for Carol Shelby and Roy Salvadori. 59, a special year. It's unlikely that Aston Martin will win overall this year. However, in saying that, Pedro Lama is sitting seventh overall. We see the roll set of Delara Judd. The hands of Joao Barbosa exit pit lane. That car is currently tenth overall. Hey, Cal, just getting back to the uh, Corvette Aston battle, you're mentioning strategy there, and of course, that is the key here at Le Mans or in any endurance race. Talk about that tyre situation with Corvette. Mm -hmm. Well, earlier in the race, Lee, they were double standing the Michelin tyres, and I checked in with Gary Pratt because both the 63 and the 64 car only single standed there and went to fresh tyres even though the driver stayed in, and he just said, we're losing too much time on the second stint on the tyres. We're losing approximately two seconds per lap to the Aston Martin. Now, we can change tyres. We talked earlier in the show about how quickly the boys are changing tyres on the vet team, about 10 seconds when they get it right. So, you know, if they can make up two seconds of the lap, they're looking at a 12 lap stint, that's 24 seconds. So you do the math, it's a lot better to have fresh tires on for each run. Hey Cal, I saw uh, while they were doing that pit stop, they pulled the left front tire off, and one of the crew guys went in there, I don't know if he had a pyrometer that he was checking the rotor temperature or the brake pad temperature, or he had a digital camera. It looked like he snapped right. the shot off. Yeah, uh, do you know which shot it was? I didn't see what happened there. I know that the mechanic went under the, the arch there to take a close look, and uh, certainly they're still concerned. They had that failure, remember, at Sebring when Johnny O had the rotor shatter on him as he went down into that fast final turn there at Sebring and hit the tires pretty hard. So I'm sure they're conscious of that. They're just trying to stay on their game here. They believe they can do the 24-hour race without changing any pads or rotors, but they're certainly going to keep a careful eye on that. I spoke to Doug Feehan. They tried to analyze their data, and they've increased the temperature on the road of their Sebring by about 25 degrees and he said that was just enough to send it over the top you lose a lot of resin in the carbon fiber rotor at that temperature and that was enough to have it explode and certainly cost them the race there plenty of weary people already it is approaching 10 past two local time in the morning here at circuit de la Saf. for someone who's not too tired he's awake to join us a semco motorsports driver in the american lamar series johnny mullen johnny great to see you and uh, it's a shame not to see you out on the track yeah, hi Lee and uh, hi Dorsey. Yeah, I must admit, I wasn't suffering too much until I was watching the start of the race and then it really hit me in the gut that I really, really wish I was here with the Celine and certainly watching all the problems that some of the cars out there have been having, it makes it even harder to swallow. Back in 2000, you achieved a wonderful result of finishing second from memory uh, in the GT2 class. Uh, you were meant to race here in GT1. Simple question, why not? Why aren't you racing? Um, it's a bit of a long political story, but the, the probably to cut a long story short, uh, Jeff Giangrande and the Asemco team have worked very, very hard, obviously with a certain package and spent a lot of money in terms of trying to get us competitive against the GM Corvettes and the ProDrive Aston Martins. And uh, the goalposts were shifted slightly due to a reinterpretation of the rules, not even a rule change. And I think Jeff felt that he didn't want to come here if he wasn't going to be competitive because he doesn't like doing things by halves, as I think most people know. So when we weren't in a position to come here with a real shot of winning, or we didn't know we were because we didn't, we weren't aware if we were going to get the, the wing, rear wing width back because we had to lose six inches of that. And it had a serious effect not only on the downforce of the car, but also the drag. He took the decision with all the logistics to make an early decision not to come here. Since then, IMSA have given us the wing back. We led at mid-Ohio for nearly 45 minutes to an hour. Maybe could have won that race with a different strategy call. So in, in that way, you know, maybe we had been here, things would have been different. But he had to make the decision when he took it, and uh, I stand by that. Johnny, had a really good run at mid-Ohio. Is there going to be um, further development onto, uh, on the chassis and car, and will you get more testing in? Well, um, Asemco have not stood still whilst the uh, Corvette have been over here. We've been uh, straight line testing, testing at Putnam, doing a shaker rig work, all sorts of things. So we're kind of hoping that maybe we might uh, shock them while they're still tired at Lime Rock. But I never underestimate uh, Prass and Miller, having watched them here. I mean, the Aston Martin seem to have uh, the edge on them in terms of speed for whatever reason, but certainly in pit stops and strategy, they're, they're doing their normal trick of uh, not putting a foot wrong. Fabulous showing from the American Le Mans Series teams, mate, particularly in GT2. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm actually at the moment in the Peterson White Lightning uh, pits who are chasing down the uh, Alex Joe Bam uh, car. Both of those, obviously, American Le Mans Series uh, teams and obviously champion running 1-2 at the moment. Louis, the last time I checked, unfortunately, Alan's obviously second out of that and I want to see him come to P1. But, uh, yeah, I think it's a uh, real... It just shows how strong the American Le Mans Series is, to be honest, that most of the teams in the classes here are being dominated by teams that run in that series.
thanks for your time, mate. Great to see you. And uh, Thank you you're going to do the whole night or are you going to go to bed? I'm going to bed now. I'm just waiting <laughs> on you guys. <laughs> thanks. Johnny Molan there from SMK Motorsport. We look forward to seeing him at no, Lime Rock Park in a couple of weeks. As we take you to the break, here are our respective top three in all four of our classes. The race leading car is still the number three ADT champion Audi to the tune of two minutes over the sister car. It's JJ Leto over Emanuele Puro and then the dome of Kenishi sitting third. P2, it's still Belmondo, Didier Andre and American Rick Sutherland. It's the Aston Martin leading GT1 and it's the BAM, Alex Joe Porsche leading GT2. Welcome back to Le Mans, the champion number three, Audi, continues to lead. Brad Kettler is the crew chief on the car. And Brad, I think you're surprised somewhat to see yourselves in the lead this early in the event, but certainly things seem to be going well tonight. Yeah, I mean, we expect, we didn't expect it, but we were hoping that this would happen. We're just a little bit surprised that it happened so early. And uh, the two car and the, the three car have been running really well, and the Pescarillos had trouble early, and we were able to get by them and uh, get away from them a little bit. So we're hoping to hold on to that. Uh, the two car had a little incident, had to have a little body work change. The three car so far has been trouble free and is, is running out in front. When you look at the timing and scoring, the Pescarello, the Dome, was certainly within a handful of laps of you. Are you concerned about them? Is that too much of a gap to make up if you don't have problems? And do you have the pace of the two car? The two car certainly runs slightly faster laps than the three car tonight. What do you think about your progress for the rest of the race? Well, we're just going to try to keep doing what we're doing. Obviously, the two car seems to be a little bit quicker. Um, it takes a long time to make up any distance here. And I think with a couple laps on the Pescarolos going into the heat of the day tomorrow, if we can keep doing what we're doing, we should be in good shape. Everyone recognizes the fact that Tom Christensen has such a remarkable record going here, potentially a seventh victory, maybe six in a row. Does the team feel any pressure with Tom coming on board this year? No, not really. We know Tom from the past, and we like to work with him. He's a devout professional to work with. Joe Hausner's worked with him a lot. He's working with us here this weekend. That's really good. I'd say the biggest thing that's a distraction is all the media attention and all the people in the garage more than anything. Well, we're certainly down here. There's been a lot of people around. The team are doing a great job. He mentioned the name Joe Hausner. He's also engineering this car this weekend alongside Brad, and he's actually orchestrated all of Tom's wins since 2000. So the three wins with Yost, the win with Bentley, and the win last year with Team Gold. When Tom climbed on board this year, I said he said they want that man on the radio once again. So he's very superstitious this year. He seems to have all his ducks in a row, Lee. I have to tell you a funny story. Earlier in, earlier in the week, when Tom Christensen was taking a walk around town, they say it's good luck. Dorse, you might be able to add to this, but a, uh, a bird that was flying above <laughs> made a deposit on his shoulder. Yeah, and he thought it was a good thing. He said it was a, it was a message from above. A so sign. He has been very superstitious this weekend. You know, he's been uh, wanting us to interview him before the race because every time that uh, we do that, he seems to win. And uh, he's trying to get all his eggs in a row. So. Two is in. This is a second place car. There's a two minute, nine second deficit to the race leading car. This is Emanuele Piro, the man who stayed in for three and a quarter hours at the opening of this race, made a slight error, ran on at Arnage, nudged the car into the tyre barrier. It was enough to force some bodywork to be changed. And that's why they are a couple of minutes behind, but they are on the lead lap. Cal. Okay. Piro is in, as you mentioned, Lee, and it looks like a routine stop. They look like they're triple stinning these Michelin tyres in the uh, cool of the night, and I'm sure he's going to try very hard to make up for that mistake that he made earlier. He spoke during the break that we had. He said that was strictly the fact that behind the pace car, he didn't get the brakes up to temperature when they went back to green. He made the mistake in Arnage. But also remember, he made a couple of mistakes running into traffic that caused him stop and go penalties at the Sebring 12 hour. Otherwise, it may have been their car that took the car to victory instead of Tom Christensen and the other boys. Well, one thing about these cars, these obvious, of course, I drove one of these cars. It's full carbon brake rotors, full carbon brake pads, and they require a lot of temperature to work in operating temperature mode. And what you can do if you're not really being on the brake pedal and getting them up to temperature is that you'll get one under the other fully up to temperature and the, and the 
if you got full fronts on, they'll just lock up. If you get full rear heat, then the rears will lock up. And I think uh, he just didn't have the balance quite right. And what you do from the driver's standpoint when you go to heat those up is you dial a little bit toward the rear brake and you start running your foot on the brake while you're on the throttle at the same time. You get all the temperatures up and then you dial your brake balance back the other way. That didn't happen, obviously. Inside the Paul Belmondo pit. These guys are running very well. They lead the P2 class. We'll have plenty more. You're watching Le Mans live here on Speed. Reminding you that tomorrow morning is NASCAR this morning. It's happening from Michigan live at 11 a.m. right here on Speed. So why don't you get an early start to your race day with NASCAR this morning, tomorrow morning right here on speed and look at that lonely trophy it won't be lonely in 13 and a half hours that's for sure tomorrow, wonder if tom christensen will be holding it tomorrow morning is this morning here already it's all just confusing i know well it's not I... confusing for this guy though johannes van overbeck thomas blam all the boys in flying lizard camp they should be happy brian till I think they are happy, Lee. One of the American teams that has all American drivers, no foreign drivers on this bunch. Johannes Van Overbeck, you guys had a great job in qualifying, but you dropped back a little bit in the race. Some problems. What went on? Well, it's the first year for the Flying Lizard team, and the team's done an incredible job considering it's their first time here. Qualified really well. We've just had a series of small issues that have set us back a little bit. Uh, we're comfortably fourth, and, you know, it's a long ways to go. It is a long way to go, but qualifying, I think, really opened a lot of people's eyes. You guys right up there towards the front. Were even you surprised by what you guys were able to do in qualifying? Well, you know, as a driver, when the car is good, it's easy, and when the car is not good, it's, you can't do much. The car was just great, and it was relatively easy. It was my first time on the uh, special qualifying tire, so I left some on the table being cautious, but yeah, we were really happy with it. They should be happy down here, guys. A great performance for their first time at Le Mans. And Lee, like you said, a very strong team down here, and especially with a guy like Thomas Blom as your strategist. This is a guy who took Yost to victory here at Le Mans with his strategy. So a long way to go. You ha heard Van Overbeck say with the strategy like they have and the team that they have, don't count these guys out. Absolutely not. And Thomas Blom led Yost to victory with the mighty R8. So he certainly knows how to read an endurance race. Let's talk about Tom Christensen, Jackie X. It is one of the big headlines this weekend, and they are tied on the all-time win list. For Jackie X, he shared his wins. He shared three of his wins with a man who we know very well here at Speed Channel, Derek Bell. He won the others with Jurgen Bath and Hurley Haywood, Gies Van Lennep, and Jackie Oliver. As we enjoy some vintage footage of the legendary Jackie X. As for Tom Christensen, he shared his wins with Stefan Johansson, the late McAlby and Michaeli Alboreto, and of course those three consecutive wins with Piro and Vila, and then Dindo Capello, who isn't racing this year, Guy Smith, and last year, Seiji Ara. So they've had a good mix, both of them, throughout their respective careers, both Jackie X and Tom Christensen. There's Derek Bell with the great man. But Tom Christensen has some very special feelings about Jackie X. And here we view Tom and his success. The first came for Porsche. Four of his wins came for Audi. And of course, one for Bentley. Their first victory in over 70 years. A lot of people say he's had luck or he's been in the right cars, but you have to do it right. You can't make any mistakes. And that's exactly the position that Tom Christensen has been in six times. The only two races that he's competed in here at Le Mans that he hasn't won, he's retired. And that tells you the story about the great Dane. But he has some very strong feelings about the Belgian Jackie X. Let's hear from Tom Christensen. Three weeks ago, Jackie X came to me and I met him and he said, you will do it. And I said, thank you, you give me the pressure. <laughs> and uh, he said records are there to to be broken, but it's not a broken record. And uh, when I was a kid, he was a man and he will remain the man. Isn't that lovely to hear, them, hear him talk about Jackie X? That was, of course, straight after last year's victory. And look at that consecutive wins. Christensen, five. What an amazing achievement. 
And of course, three of those five came with the next two on the list, Frank Bieler and Emanuele Pirro. Absolutely unbelievable record. You know, it take, it's taken so long to even get up to where Jackie X's record was. And to break it for Christensen, I can't imagine anyone. You have to understand only not only five wins or six wins or seven, that's seven years out of your life you have to spend to get that. The Tuscan TBR is in for Peninsula Race Sport. It's the one and only. TBR in this year's event. And he's going in the garage. Yeah, problems here. Yep, he just pulls the nose right in and says, uh, we got problems here, and they're gonna push that one in and do some work on it. It's way down the list anyway, so. And of course we are at the mercy of VCF, the uh, host broadcaster here in France. And a lot of tired people, as you could well understand, it is half past two in the morning local time. Hey, right on cue. The boys in Pescarolo Sport are having a rest. Meanwhile, Team Yota, the Zytec, is back in. Speed Channel's coverage of the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by new Mobile One Extended Performance. That's oil changing oil. By Carfax. Don't buy a used car without it. And by Porsche. Porsche, there is no substitute. The nighttime rolls on, but bam, Alex Job rolls on to a successful end. Perhaps they're going well, Brian Till. Indeed they are, Liam. Mike Rockenfeller brought the 71 Porsche in. Routine stop, fuel and tires only. He will double stint as a driver, but they did change tires, and you got to really give it to this team. Don't forget, they're on the Yokohama tire, and that is a tire that is somewhat unknown. They did not have the super sticky qualifier that you heard Johannes Van Overbeck speak of with the Michelin so a tremendous job by this team they lead GT2 right now so let me give you a rundown through the top 10 it's Audi Audi for ADT champion Audi Leto over Puro then it's the all Japanese contingent Dome and five. Mugen with Kenishi then it's the first of the Pescarolo Judds in fourth place Eric Comas and how quickly that can ebb and flow that was the pace setting car the pole setting car it had gear, <coughs> gear shift problems and dropped to as low as 16th. It's now back up to fourth. Fifth is the all-French Audi with Frank Montani, the Formula One test driver. Then in sixth overall, it's the first GT1 car, the Aston Martin with Pedro Lamy. Then it's Sam Hignett in the Team Yota Zytec is seventh overall. Then we've got two GT1 Corvettes with Magnussen over Pappas. And tenth is the DBA Judd for Jamie Campbell Walter. What a sight that is. The fairground, the amusements here at Le Mans, there are plenty too. A lot and of I, people having a great time. You know, you can't emphasize enough that it looks like one or two laps between these cars, but that's nothing. You come in and you have any kind of a problem, two laps disappears real fast. I love the title that Andrew Marriott gives this team, Roll Center Racing. Martin Short, the team principals, Raul Barbosa and Vanina X. It's the little team that can. They continue to fight on. They're in 11th position overall, and Calvin is standing by with Vanina X. Indeed, the legendary name of X returns here to Le Mans. This time it's Jackie's daughter, Vanina. Vanina, your debut with a prototype car at Le Mans has gone very well. The team are running up to second. You've dropped back a little bit in the going. What has been the problem with the car this evening? Well, since uh, I got in the car, or, or since the very beginning, we have a leak in the power steering system. And it's getting worse and worse, so each thing we have to fill it up with new uh, Unfortunately, it's getting so bad that we, at some point, uh, will have to, to change the whole uh, power steering because it's um, sometimes on, sometimes off. You never know when uh, when when it'll happen, so it's uh, kind of dangerous that way. You've run here at Le Mans in the GT category before, but your first effort in a prototype what has it been like i know your teammates have been incredibly impressed by how you've got up to speed i know joao babosa told me over in the states a couple of weeks ago he was really looking forward to the race with you today uh, what is the question how have you felt about driving the prototype has it been difficult it's it's amazing it's completely different from the gt car it's a new exercise a new race i need to get used to all kind of things and especially to last 
What sort of advice does your father give you when you come to this racetrack where he had so many victories over the years? He said I uh, have to be cautious. Well, congratulations on a great effort. We look forward to seeing the car get to the finish line. Thanks. And I'll tell you what, when you have a power steering unit, they've been putting oil in this all night long. They come in, they put oil in. It's leaking down around the foot well, and that means your feet are sliding around. Worse than that, though, the power steering comes and goes. And a car that's supposed to have power steering, when it loses it, it loses it, and it becomes such a really hard thing to steer. What will happen is you'll be in the middle of a corner under a heavy load on the corner, and you'll have power steering. All of a sudden, the power steering will fail. You'll have to use a lot of muscle to keep the car going that direction. If it should kick back in, all of a sudden, you've got too much steering, and it is, as she said, dangerous. Well, when morning breaks here at Le Mans, many, many things have usually changed, and they could certainly crawl and climb their way back up the leaderboard. The best finish by a female here at Le Mans was way back in 1932. Fourth place overall by Odette Seco. Can Benina X better that, equal it? We will wait and see. Top three in all of our four classes as we take a break. And we will be with you for around about another hour and a half, live from Le Mans. It's the 73rd running. Stick around. stuff this is truly an addictive engaging place except when you have to work the whole time <laughs> like these guys in the ADT champion now there's Lewis Malone he runs the number two car and uh, it's hard work hard hard work for the boys from Pompano Beach Florida for everybody and you take the rest when you can get the rest the Cruise Motorsport gang in LMP2 they've had a tough time at one stage this was a class-leading car, but they've had several offs, and you just can't do that here, Dawson. They've had a lot of offs, and it's been quite surprising. You look at the car, how clean it still is, because it's had several spins. It's been in trouble several times. The team, obviously, doing a really great job of uh, keeping the wheels on the uh, keeping the wheels on the train there, I suppose. One of the big stories we've been talking about throughout this broadcast is the possibility, the prospect of an American team winning overall, and that would be the ADT champion Audi team. The last time was back in 1967. AJ Foyt, Dan Gurney winning in their Ford GT40. Boy, it's been a long time between drinks. That's been a very long time between drinks, and that a very famous car with the bubble on the roof, because Dan Gurney was too tall to fit underneath it. You see Dan Gurney there spraying the champagne. Let me read you a quote. I was so stoked that when they handed me the Magnum, I shook the bottle and began spraying the photographer's drivers, Henry Ford II, Carol Shelby and their wives. It was a very special moment at that time. I was not aware that I'd started a tradition that continues in Winner's Circle all over the world to this day. Race leader is in. You would most certainly like to be shaking the champagne bottle and carrying on that tradition. Calvin? Well, the champion guys go to work. JJ Leto brings the car in. There will be a driver change. JJ just completed a triple stint here. It's going to be Marco Werner, the only non-Lamar winner currently in the squad here tonight. And he's certainly going to play his part. He's been extremely fast, two times ALMS champion. This fueling should take about 27 seconds for the 80 liters that they're running this year. And then they'll do the tire change. I just spoke to Brad Kettler. They are now going to the soft compound. It's really cooled down here in the last hour. And he said, we're going soft. We're really going to try and get the hammer down. They are very concerned about the pace of the two machine. 
next up in that car is going to be Alan McNish. And he set the fastest race lap of all of the Audis here the, during the day, so they expect him to be really on a march when he gets behind the wheel tonight. He'll be chomping at the bit, as always. Good clean stop. Werner underway. He stalls it momentarily. And I think this is a consequence, Lee. They brought out this rule this year, whereas if the guys get it sideways coming out of their pit box, they will get a penalty. And I know when they take off, they've really been very conservative. They normally really pop a lot more revs. So I don't know if the Audi have been reprogrammed with the electronics there. They have a launch control on these things, where typically it's out of their hands. They don't actually touch the throttle. They just hit a button, but it certainly doesn't jump out of the pit box like it has in previous events. And when we heard about this rule amendment of not getting the car sideways out of the pit box, out of pit lane, had a lot of people scratching their heads, Dorsey. What, what are your thoughts? I mean, and especially for the R8, you've driven it. Well, it's a bit of a surprise to me, too, because that uh, if you were on launch control when I drove it, you uh, pushed a button on the dash, and when they dropped you off the jacks, you pushed the start button, and the car would go completely sideways. Yeah. You were just steering it. Now, obviously, they've had to reprogram that, or they've returned control to the driver to use the clutch, but these cars don't like using the clutch. Calvin? Well, JJ's jumped out. He's got a cool cloth there, just trying to calm down a little bit. JJ, how's the car working? The car is working well, but you know, it's so ridiculous with these powers, you know, we are having at the moment. You know, you can't get by anybody. You get blocked so many times, you know, it's just the consistency is so bad this year with the car. You can't just do lap after lap. You lost suddenly five seconds, eight seconds, you know, and then you are back on a, on a time again for one or two laps, and then you lose it again. Traffic is so bad, it's just, uh, well, it's not the traffic, but we are slow. We are definitely too slow. You seem frustrated. How hard is it for you to be patient behind the wheel when you see big chunks of time going away with this traffic situation? and you've got the number two car charging behind well they're charging but you know they are they are sort of under control anyway the difference is pretty much the same all the time sometimes you lose sometimes the other car loses so it's, it's staying pretty much the same but there will be uh, some attack in some states for sure whoever is doing it our car is good but you know it's a slow all right slow but they're leading brian well, Calvin, another car that has been slowed by problems all day long is the number 78, Pano. Marino Franchitti just brought it in. Patrick Bourdais will take over the father of Sebastian Bourdais. A routine stop, fuel and tires. They'll get back out. And interestingly enough, Marino Franchitti is actually staying in the Bourdais home. The Bourdais live not far from Le Mans. He's actually staying in Sebastian Bourdais' room. And he said, you know what? Clutch problems has been the big issue there for the sole remaining Pano's Esperante. Sadly, the trio of Bill Orblin, Robin Liddell and Scott Maxwell, the 77 Pano's is out. There is the rest, the update, the American Le Mans, the American teams here at Le Mans. Reminding you that tomorrow right here on speed, it is the United States Formula One Grand Prix. Qualifying is done with. And Toyota may not be going too well in IRL, but boy, have they got it together in F1. Yano truly giving Toyota its first pole. Kimi Raikkonen will start alongside, but McLaren teammate Juan Montoya struggling back in 11th. The US Grand Prix tomorrow live right here on Speed. Hope you can join us. Speaking of F1, champions to have raced here at Le Mans. What a lineup that is. It is indeed there. You see current reigning champion Michael Schumacher's been here. Bunch of notable others. Sir Jackie Stewart at the bottom of the list there, but certainly not at the bottom. And Sir Jack Brabham, his son, is in this event. David Brabham driving the Aston Martin DBR9 number 59 to commemorate the win in 1959. Can they do it again? They are several laps down, and they're in 13th overall and have some work to do to catch up on the front runners in GT1. Particularly Peter Cox, the class leader, who is sixth overall. That is incredible for a GT1 car to be that high up this early. It is incredible indeed. That just shows you the attrition early in this race. But it really doesn't mean anything because there's such a long time yet to go. Sometimes, you know, when you're driving these 24-hour races, you feel, you feel like if you can just make the sunrise, if I can just get to where the sun comes up tomorrow, then you feel like you have a victory in your grasp possibly but you got to realize when the sun comes up tomorrow you still got a long way to go you talk about attrition rate doors 49 cars started it's typically 50 cars but we lost one early in the weekend 49 started 36 remain so 
We're chewing through the field, that's for sure. It's been a ferocious pace so far. Brian, what do you have? Well, Lee, the 37 P2 car is in. DDA Andre was behind the wheel. I just had a chance to grab him quickly and ask him what was wrong. He said, first we had a fuel alarm, so I started to come to pit road, but then we had a lot of smoke in the cockpit, so you see the guys working feverishly on some of the electronics over on the passenger or left side of this machine trying to figure out what was going on with the wiring why it was smoking but anyway you look at it this was the p2 leader and they're now sitting in the garage it's not where you want to be no, they still are the p2 leader though you know brian it's kind of funny but when you look at these race cars and how they're engineered and put together uh almost everything's easily replaceable with the exception of electrics electrics would seem like the snap through all the time if you have an electrical fire or, or wires start burning those things aren't easy to fix at all this is the RML Lola MG. Mike Newton, who is in fact one of the part owner of Ray Malik Limited, he's behind the wheel and they currently sit third in this class. Karim OJ in the garage is second. But boy, in terms of the entire field, the P2 cars are a long way back. 22nd overall is your class leader. 24th is second. And this car here, the RML. Lola MG is 26th overall. These P2 cars seem to have a lot of trouble. I always equate it to how fragile they are because they're so light. They have to build them very light, so you use light components and lighter things, and those are the things that shake themselves apart. I, I think it's possibly, I don't want to say the most exciting for the future, but you're going to see a lot of change. There's some terrific cars in this category, and they're only going to get better. This is the, the, the Lola. You've got the new Garage, the new Lola. Uh, the power plants are coming. It's a diverse range. And, of course, with the Penske Porsche that is coming into the American Le Mans series at the end of this year, the Good Petit point. Le Mans at Road Atlanta, it's a class on the move. Good point there, no question about that, with the reliability of Porsche. And with Roger Penske coming together with these, these LMP2 cars are very, very fast. Make no mistake about it. They can run at the same speed as the one cars. One minute 49 is the lead margin. Marco Verna over Emanuele Piro and the Dome Mugen with Rio Mishigami is in the top three. Stick around. Back live at Le Mans, Lee Diffie, Dorsey Schrader, Brian Till, Calvin Fish. You're looking at the race leading car. But Cal, tell us what's just happened. Three car was in, Lee, the number three car was in. That looks like the, the flat spot of the tire or had a puncture. Marco Werner brought the car in, quick tire change. Meanwhile, Alan McNish are getting ready to jump in the two car. We saw a great battle between you and Thomas Sebring coming right down to the wire. Do you relish this opportunity once again? Well, we're in a similar position. We're coming from behind, but we're now one minute 40 behind instead of three minutes, and that's a nice place to be. We're going in the right direction. The good news is this race has lasted a lot longer than it did last year for you. No, that's for sure. Um, you look a lot better. Too. <laughs> I feel a lot better than I did. No, it's, everything's gone pretty well so far, and uh, the team have done a good job, and we're able to sort of just pick up the pace and pick up where other people have dropped it as well. Because like the Pescadolos were superb at the beginning, but they just haven't been able to last the pace. Seemed like you were the quickest Audi on the track during your first stint. Really got the hammer down, running 340s there. Do you expect to have a little bit more pace in the three car tonight? Is there any difference in setup, downforce wise, or whatever? The brakes there, or is it just you getting the? The pedal to the metal. No, we've got heavy right feet in the number two car. That's what it is. You need the pri prize money. you got to feed the baby, right? <laughs> exactly. You know how the deal is. <laughs> All right, mate. We look forward to watching. Thank you. Of course, they're talking about last year when Alan McNish had a big accident early in the race. He actually made impact with the barrier, got out of the car, got back into the race, brought the car to pit lane, and then got out of the car and passed out and doesn't remember even getting the car back to the pit. So he had a bit of a concussion going there. This year, uh, obviously, he's in a little bit better situation. He is a mighty, mighty driver. And on a day where he's fully focused on Le Mans, he certainly will be thinking about Indianapolis at one stage too, with Toyota getting its first pole, and he contributed to that for a couple of years. These are the cars that are out of the 73rd running of the Michelin 24 hours of Le Mans. Sadly, the Panos Esperante is gone. The Lola AER for Hugh Chamberlain and his gang. It's all over for those. The Courage Judd, the Bastian Briere, Juan Barazzi and Zloban. The Pilbeam, Mike Pilbeam debuting at Le Mans. His new, his first carbon fibre Pilbeam. 
prototype machine. It's out already. The list goes on. Look, it's quite extensive. Sadly, the 34 LMP2 car for Miracle Motorsports is out, and so too the Liz, ha Liz Halliday Hancock and Fiskin entry out. Two prototypes we were looking forward to seeing at the front of that pack. Yeah, really heavy attrition with the um, with all the Ferraris as well. That car back underway, Luke Alphonse's car. Uh, this attrition, you know, I couldn't believe at the beginning of the race lead, the pace that was set by the Pescarolos took off like crazy. Audi's hot in pursuit. Everybody else giving it just all they had, and then it all just started falling apart. I mean, 24-hour races are just that. You can't win till tomorrow, and everybody has to have a game plan that can match what their car does. The one who's done it best so far, in my estimation, without question, is Audi, as if they're on exactly the pace they need, and they're racing one another right now. As we said right at the top of the show, this track can bite the record number of what the French call abandonments, what we call retirements, was 40 back in 1952. I don't think we'll get there this year. And up front, it's about a minute and a half separating the two ADT champion Audis. An exclusive Speed Channel's coverage continues of the Michelin 24 hours of Le Mans and Alan McNish standing by. Wait to see the lap times. The diminutive Scott will turn once he gets hold of the number two ADT champion R8. There is only 38 seconds separating first and second. It's the sister cars, Marco Verna over Manuele Piro, who again has done a great job, but it's time to hand over to Alan McNish. Welcome back, everyone. Lee Diffie, Dorsey Schrader, Calvin Fish, Brian Till. We're with you for another hour, right through until four in the morning here, local time in Le Mans. And this looks like Piro coming in. He's stuck behind a GT2 car. Oh, that's not good. He'll give him a, a little push here if he has to. There's a pit lane speed limit, and obviously the Porsche's not quite up to it. It's uh, 37 miles per hour, 60 kilometers, and that's pretty slow. Just watch the routine that they go to. You can get all too blasé, but they, what they have to do is very specific. Just watch the driver change. Piro out, McNish in. Both these guys use the seat insert. Frankie Velo, I believe, does not. He's the biggest one of these three drivers on the team. Practicing their driver changes under the auspices of the engineer Graham Taylor the other day. The guys had it down to about 21 seconds. They typically like to try and get it done by the time the refueling is complete. That then leaves the car clear for these guys to work on the tyres. Now, we spoke to JJ, who's very frustrated about it. He said the car is slow. We're talking about that restrictor that's been placed on the Audi this year. 5% less in the whole size on the restrictor. It's worth about 35 horsepower, and that really means they have to do all of their overtaking in the Break zone service is complete. McNish underway. The Scottish Terrier ready to go and snap at the heels of that number three. Let's not forget they're carrying an extra 110 pounds as well. McNish up to speed. Had a great chat with Alan the other day and asked him about the six ADT champion Audi drivers. And I said, Is there anyone who is who's the best on fuel economy? Who is the smoothest, etc.? And he said very unselfishly and without any ego involved and he said Frankie Biela is amazing he said I have never seen such a smooth steering input the telemetry that comes back when Frank Biela is in the car is incredible and what he's talking about is the amount of steering that you use to get the car through a specific corner I mean it's different it's not the same with every driver Frank turns in very slowly very smoothly uses minimal steering wheel movement some people are more abrupt with more steering angle Take a look at the top 10 overall. Audi R8, Audi R8, it's champion one and two. And the Dome Mugen is doing a wonderful job. That's for Jim Gaynor International. That's the name of the team. Can't remember if Andrew Marriott said this on air or not yet, but he found it very amusing that Jim Gaynor actually doesn't exist. It was just a name made up. They made it up because it sounded like a good name for a car <laughs> owner in the United States. And we roll back to the top 20. And in that, we get to the top guys in GT2. In 17th, Mike Rockefeller is leading the class. 
for the Alex Joe Bam collaboration. Second in GT2 is Patrick Long, the American Porsche factory driver. And third is the Raymond Narak entry, and the team principal is behind the wheel. Interesting story there, too. That guy, 10 years ago, was the chief mechanic for Labra competition. Let's get it back to Calvin. Well, the champion team look over some video. Meanwhile, Emanuele Piro looks at the timing board and uh, great stint there, Emanuele. You've really got the car back on the lead lap and really snapping at the heels of the leader. You look very tired. How tough is it to do these triple stints tonight? Yeah, we're back on the lead lap, but uh, it's very tough out there. This, uh, this stint was really hard. There was a lot of people going really slow and uh, overtaking was really, really difficult. Um, lots of people with not uh, so much experience, whole, you know, being lost, and uh, every lap was uh, losing a lot of time in traffic. It must be mentally draining when you're really on your tubes. There's one thing to be in a rhythm and the car's working well, but if every corner with traffic is an issue, it really keeps you on your toes and costs a lot of energy for you. Yes, it is, and also after the mistake I did earlier on, it was really, you know, careful and making sure that <laughs> I did not do anything wrong but uh, yeah okay the race is still going on let's see Lee Diffie's up in the booth and he has a question something about your pilot's license is this an in joke here Lee Diffie wants to ask you about your pilot's license uh, that's going really well uh, I passed the exams I was the first on the course and I was very happy but now we are thinking about something else you know to concentrate on the race and uh, we, we got to hang on right now I'm I'm tired I've done four stints at the start with very high temperature and now three stints and I, I need to sleep with the incident that you had when you went back to green earlier we were away from the race at that point on speed tell us what happened to Manuele when you had the problem over in Anage The race car face was so long and uh, the tires felt like there was temperature and uh, when I approached the Arnage corner, just just starting going into green, I pressed the brake pedal and it was like solid hard with no, no bite and I had to press very hard and I locked the wheels and I went straight, you know. Normally you would say it's a beginner's mistake. Well, certainly they've recovered well. Go and get some rest. Thanks for spending time with us. Yeah, it's sad because I had a big lead. Uh, we had like 50 seconds, then the pace car neutralized it, and we got behind the wrong pace car, and we lost a lot of time. But okay, this is racing, you know. Uh, let's uh, think about, look about the future, not at the past. Okay, they're going to look forward and look forward to hopefully seeing that checkered flag tomorrow, Lee. One of the crazy things about carbon fiber brakes is that when they're cold, you can push your foot on the brake pedal and it's just completely rock solid hard. You can push both feet on the brake pedal as hard as you want to, but it will not stop the car, and that's what he's talking about. Time in the pits, the lead car, 15.45 and a minute plus is the damage for the number two and there is only a minute 56 separating those two cars can you believe it we're almost at the halfway mark and less than two minutes separate the top two speed channel's coverage of the michelin 24 hours of le mans is brought to you by audi in technology performance and design our goal remains constant never follow Welcome back to Le Mans, everyone. And speaking of Audi, we have three Audi teams racing here. Two cars within the Champion ADT camp and one in the PlayStation Team Orica organization. And Audi have a very interesting process that they go through each time here at Le Mans. Of course, there is no official factory team running. So what they do with their customer teams is this. They simply flip a coin. There's Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich in the middle. He was there to witness it. This is in an effort to remain impartial and unbiased. Just in uh, Audi Sports attempt to be impartial to all the teams, uh, just to ensure that it's completely random. Uh, they have an engine lottery. It's a tradition now that's happened the last couple of years here at Le Mans. And uh, it's just, just really the engines all come equally prepared, but just to disperse any you know, condition that there might be a difference in any of them, that there might be a pick for a favorite or whatever, and there isn't. 
Pretty interesting. <laughs> you could be more fair than that, now could you? You pick out what you want, and that's it. And away you go. Well, at the moment, Johnny O'Connell is the highest placed American driver in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Previously, it was this man, Elton Julian. He's with Brian. Well, Lee, you talk about American drivers, and we've turned out some good ones, you know. How about an American driver being the youngest to ever win in Formula 3? Elton Julian is that guy, and then ran some Formula 3000. But where have you been lately, bud? You know, as so many times this happens to so many young drivers, it's, it's tough. It's tough to find the sponsorship to continue racing in Europe as an American. And fortunately for me, I, I persevered long enough that the tide has turned and there's some support coming this way. And uh, I'm back at Le Mans at, 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 a, at a level that I feel I should be racing at. Well, I mean, it's a great team here and it's great to see you here and back in a race car. I know you guys had problems earlier on. The car sat here in the garage for a while. What were the problems? Well, unfortunately, we, we ran fifth for, the, for a very, very long time, and very competitively. And um, we had a, a punctured radiator. Don't really know how it happened, but you know, that's Le Mans for you. We're, we're only halfway through, and anything can happen from here. Yeah, anything can happen. Hey, Dorsey Schrader's up in the booth. He says to tell you hello. Hi, Dorsey. How are you? <laughs> All right, guys. They're going to keep tracking on with his car. You know, it's just like Elton said, anything can happen. We've still got a long way to go. You know what's surprising? Elton Julian was one of my students back at Skip Barber a long time ago. Really turned out to be a stellar race car driver. Uh, kind of stalled out on his career. This is the first time he's driven a car in six years. And let me tell you something. The boy's back. He's turning heads again. <laughs> He was one of my students. He turned out to be a stellar driver. That's right. You giving yourself a pat on the back? No, nah, him. I mean, every <laughs> man's got to carry his own deal. Bro. <laughs> Elton is an awesome driver and deserves a riding table. These guys are having an awesome run as well. Flying Lizard Motorsports. They sit fourth in class and for all three drivers. It's their first time at Le Mans. Great effort. They roll back out. Van Overbeck, Nyman, Pechnik. They'll be looking forward to seeing the morning in a few hours' time.